In this set of lectures, we will talk about time value of money. After a brief introduction, we will go over the different possible interpretations of interest rates, talk about the concept of future value, both for a single cash flow and then a series of cash flows. Then we will talk about present value, again for a single cash flow and a series of cash flows. And finally, we will work on some problems which involve solving for rates, number of periods, size of annuity payments, and so on. A brief introduction. If you have $100 today versus an option to receive $100 after three years, so this is time zero, this is at the end of three years, what would you prefer? Obviously, you would prefer $100 today. Even though we have $100 in both cases, you prefer $100 today. This means that there has to be some value associated with time because you are putting more value on the $100 that you are getting today relative to the $100 at a later point in time. The money today or the value today is called the present value. At times, this could be an investment which you make at time zero. The value at a future point in time is called the future value. Let us say that you are indifferent between $100 today versus $110 after one year. This $110 is then referred to as a future value at the end of year one. The relationship or the link between present value and future value is established through a interest rate. And what we are going to get, what we are going to do in this reading is essentially talk about these concepts. Present value, future value, and the way we link these two concepts using interest rates. The central theme is interest rates. So let's talk about the different interpretations of interest rates. Interest rates can be interpreted as number one, a required rate of return or a discount rate or a opportunity cost. Say you lend $900 today and receive $990 after one year. So if we put this on a timeline, time zero, you lend 900 so let's put a minus sign to indicate money out and then after one year you get 990 back the fact that you are willing to do this you are willing to give 900 dollars today on the condition that you get 990 after one year means that to engage in this transaction you are requiring a return of 10 percent I'm sure you can calculate this given that you are lending 900 today or investing 900 today and getting 990 after one year, that interest rate is 10%. And the required rate of return interpretation is simply saying that you require a return of 10% to engage in this overall transaction. So that is the required rate of return interpretation. Discount rate is also straightforward and we'll cover it briefly here and in a lot more detail later. But if you think of the money that you are getting after one year, which is 990, you can discount 990 at 10% to get the present value of 900. And therefore, the 10% can also be thought of as a discount rate. And finally, opportunity cost. Let's say that you had taken the $900 and spent it on something else. What you have then done is you have foregone the 10% return that you might have received. And if you remember, the concept of opportunity cost is the cost of what you forego. In this particular case, what you have foregone is the 10% return. Therefore, 10% is also be thought of as a opportunity cost. We shift gears a little bit now and look at interest rates from an investor perspective. 
as an investor we can think of interest rate as a sum of multiple components the first component is the real risk free interest rate this is the rate that you get on a security that has no risk and is extremely liquid and we make an assumption here that there is no inflation we can then add on a inflation premium inflation premium is the expected annual inflation in the upcoming period we can also then add the default risk premium this is the additional premium that a investor requires because of the risk of default and you can understand this through a simple example let's say that you lend some money to person a and also lend some money to person b to both these people you are lending 100 dollars initially if b has a high risk of default so you are worried that b might not pay then you might demand a higher return from b because of that risk of default that additional return that you will demand from b because of the risk of default is called the default risk premium next we have liquidity premium this is the premium an investor demands because of the lack of liquidity of a uh, investment here again think of two investments c and d which are similar in all regards the only difference is that investment c is liquid extremely liquid whereas investment d is not that liquid clearly as a investor we will demand a higher return on d because it is not liquid that additional return that we demand is called the liquidity premium and finally we have maturity premium the idea being that if you have two securities again let's say e and f e has a maturity of 1 year and f has a maturity of let's say 4 years because f has a longer maturity it has a higher risk in terms of the price of f being more sensitive to changes in interest rate and this is a concept that you will understand better when we do fixed income securities but for now you can just take it as a given that f has higher risk because of the longer maturity and obviously an investor will demand some compensation for that higher level of risk so the sum of the real risk free rate and the inflation premium is often referred to as the risk free rate or the nominal risk free rate so if our real risk free rate is 3% and the inflation premium is 2% then the nominal risk free rate is 5% if you hear the term risk free rate then the assumption is that we are talking about the nominal risk free rate let's look at a practice question jill smith wishes to compute the required rate of return which of the following premiums is she least likely to include the correct answer is c nominal premium and we say that because while this sounds like a nice term but it is clearly not included in the list of premiums that you saw on the previous slide it is possible that you'll see a question like this on the exam so make sure that you know all the premiums really well next question which the correct answer is c the required rate of return is the minimum rate of return so a and b are correct options c is not correct because of this this is a mistake and since we are looking for least likely true c is the choice another practice question say you have five different investments and we have the maturities for each investment the liquidity default risk and a interest rate for each investment why is there a difference between the interest rate on investment a and investment b they have the same maturity they have the same default risk but interest rates are different and the answer is because of the difference in liquidity does it make sense that the return on b is higher the answer is yes because b has lower liquidity 
and therefore investors will demand a higher return for investing in B relative to investing in A. That higher return happens to be 0.5%. So in our simplistic example here, 0.5% is the liquidity premium. Next question is estimate the default risk premium. And before you go on, try to solve this on your own. If you look at investments D and E, notice that they are both three-year investments. They have a different liquidity in the sense that D is high liquidity, E is low liquidity, default risk is different, and interest rates are different. What we need to do is make the liquidity the same. Let's say that D for some reason goes from high liquidity to low liquidity. Will that change the interest rate? The answer is yes. If the liquidity becomes low, then investors will require a higher return. And we've already determined that the liquidity premium is 0.5%. So we add 0.5% and we have 3.5% as a return. Then what we can do is the following. If we have this newer version of D, let's call it D bar or D complement. So this has a low liquidity versus E, which also has low liquidity. Default risk here is high. The difference between the new version of D and E is 0.5%. This means that the default risk premium is equal to 0.5%. And finally, can you calculate the upper and lower limits for the interest rate on investment C? Notice that between B and C, the only difference is that C has a longer maturity, which means that the interest rate on C must be greater than B. So we can say that R has to be greater than the return on B, which is 2.5%. So R has to be greater than 2.5. And if you look at the low liquidity version of D, that has a return of 3.5%. Other than that, it is similar to C because liquidity is the same, default risk is the same. So maturity is less. So maturity for investment C is less than the maturity for investment D. That means that R has to be less than 3.5. So the range for R has to be between 2.5 and 